In this episode, I'm going to uh, talk about the Caucasus, uh, because we've been talking about Nart sagas, and they're from the Caucasus. And uh, I entitled this little segment, Small Nations, Big World. Um, the Caucasus is a region uh, that is sort of at a crossroad of civilizations. It is uh, between the Black Sea and Caspian Sea, and uh, insofar as it's familiar, uh, you would know it as all those fancy mountains in Sochi, in the background at Sochi, those are the mountains of the Caucasus. Geographers place it, technically speaking, inside Europe, and that makes it the tallest mountain range in Europe, taller than the Alps. Um, in this area, uh, which is about the size of Spain, including the adjacent flatlands and between the two uh, seas of Black and Caspian, uh, there are 50 people speaking 50 languages. And of these uh, 50 languages, they fall into three uh, families that are not related to any of the surrounding big families with which we're familiar. So in the steppes, in the world of the nomads, originally the language was Turkic, it still is out in Central Asia, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Kyrgyz. Um, and these are related to the languages in Turkey. And then to the west, of course, and further north of those are the European languages, uh, like Russian and then German, and Slavic languages, Germanic languages, French, etc. And then south, in the Middle East, you get Iranian a bit toward the southeast, and then you get Semitic languages like Arabic, and earlier things like Aramaic and Hebrew um, in the uh, territory uh, below the Caucasus. So it's the, the languages are wedged between three major language families, Indo-European, Altaic, Turkic, and Semitic, and the three major civilizations, the nomadic civilization, more settled civilizations on the periphery, and Middle Eastern culture uh, below. We think, we think, and it's a guess, it's a nice guess and it's a plausible guess, but it's a guess, that this area, as complex as it is, is was more typical, or is more typical, of what the language landscape looked like, say, before 5,000 years ago. And what's happened, starting around 5,000 years ago, was that one group called the Indo-Europeans began to spread out. They were nomads, domesticated the horse, very mobile, they started spreading out. And from that period on, we had an era in which we had large language families emerge, large groups spreading out, differentiating over time, and giving rise to a host of related languages, but still identifiable as having a common origin. And that this expansion process, first with Indo-European and then with Semitic down below, and then in the later historical period, actually, the uh, expansion of the Huns and Turks, and giving us the Turkic world, Mongols a bit, and that they flattened it out. They, f they absorbed all this diversity, leaving islands here and there. One is stranded a little non-Indo-European Basque up in the mountains, the Pyrenees Mountains, uh, between France and Spain. But the big one, the big mess, is in the Caucasus. And this has preserved, has resisted these great waves of expansion and preserved the original linguistic diversity that must have characterized most of the planet Earth. We have reinforcement from this when looking at places like North America, South America, where we had original language uh, distributions, also places like Australia and Africa, where there have been huge language expansions, say in Africa, it's not so, so good, but in North America, there are some expansions, but basically we get enormous diversity still. California was probably linguistically the most diverse region in North America. And uh, we think, again, that diversity was natural. And we see it as weird, but uh, anyway. So let's get back to the Caucasus and talk about specifically what we see. There are three families indigenous, that's to say peculiar to, originating in the Caucasus itself. One of these is the language family to which Georgian belongs. And we call it South Caucasian because they're on the south side of the mountains. Or we call it Kartvelian, which is based on the, the root of which the Georgians used to, did, to designate themselves. Uh, Georgian, as a word, comes from the Turkish Gurtu, uh, which is um, uh, some kind of designation. We don't know what it means, but it's what the Turks call them, and we borrowed it. But the original is Kartveli. Um, another group is the northeastern group. Uh, up in the high mountains of what's called Dagestan, which is simply Turkish for land of mountains. And uh, there you have 38 languages, um, none of which would be familiar to the, the average uh, person other than a specialist, except for one important one, very prominent one, Chechen. 
and sadly they are prominent and known because of the wars they've suffered in the last 20 years or so. Um, but there they form a certain pattern there and then even perhaps darker, more less known even, even than, than the Dagestan languages are the Northwest Caucasian languages. And these would consist of Circassian, uh, Abkhazian, and you may have heard of the, that in the Abkhazian-Georgian War of the 1990s, and then uh, a language between those two called Ubuk. Now, each of these language families has its own distinctive characteristic. Um, what is most striking to the professional who goes in and starts looking at these is how complicated these languages are. Um, Georgian has a wide range of sounds, and it has some peculiar sounds that sound almost like clicks. So there's um, a tendency to, to make, say, a T-like sound, but also to raise the back of the tongue at the same time. And I'll give you, and also all these bizarre consonant clusters. So there's Tbilisi, Tbilisi, T-B, that's the name of the capital. And then there's Tbili, Tbili, and that's a T-K with a throat closed off, a peculiar feature of, of all the languages there. Uh, Tkbili, meaning sweet, and that tka, tka is actually a single consonant. It sounds like two to us, but to Georgian it sounds like one. So they have these peculiar features. They have a lot of consonants, and they have like four or five vowels, okay? But the real weirdness of Georgian begins with how it expresses itself, what we call the syntax of it. So if you want to say something like, I am kissing her, that's okay. But if you want to say that I kissed her, it's me kissed she. It sounds just the opposite from English. <laughs> but in Georgian, it simply means that the action has been completed in some way, as opposed to kissing, meaning it's incomplete in some sense. I'll give you an example from my own family. My daughter, when she was little uh, and sitting with me at dinner, and I was the last one to finish. I'm a slow eater, <laughs> the last one to finish my meal. She said, Mommy, Daddy's eating at dinner. Hmm, okay. And that's sort of what Georgian would say if the action's incompleted. She didn't finish it in Georgian, <laughs> or her English version of Georgian, uh, and say, uh, dinner ate daddy, <laughs> or something like that. Uh, so um, she wasn't quite there, but she was halfway there, and uh, she was giving it a try. And the Georgians ca carry that, and they, they run with that. And uh, that is something that even a seasoned uh, polyglot, I have a friend who knows over 50 languages, even he tried to do Georgian, he boggled on it, and I said, you know, it doesn't work that way, it works this way. <laughs> so there's nothing else around that seems to do that. Um, then we go to, say, Chechen and Dagestani. They have lots and lots of consonants and lots and lots of vowels. They have just lots and lots. Uh, and they have sustained consonants. So they'll have things like s and they'll have things like s. <laughs> uh, and it's a distinct sound. It's not just two of that. Of course, you can double the long one as well, and you get s as in s. Ah, okay, and say, so, well, I'll go out and get a, a, a coffee and I'll come back and you'll finish the word here. Um, we find it in some of the Finnic languages and particularly Estonian, and we find it in um, Odawa and Delaware, uh, Algonquian languages of North America. And um, so Odawa, it sounds like duh, but when it gave the name to the capital of Canada, Ottawa with two T's, they're trying somehow to capture a prolonged sound. Uh, so. It's very rare, but there it is, okay. And um, then we go to uh, Northwest Caucasian, to Circassian. Let's hold for a sound. You're hearing the sirens? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Uh, maybe, there's a, maybe there you can go back a few sentences. Yeah, I'll go back. I'll start again with the, the weirdness or something like okay. that. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, well. Mm -hmm. you know, Even in the, the studio, uh, you got to hold for sound every now and then. Or if it's a student in the middle of downtown. Okay. Yeah, right, right. Okay, I think we're good. Well, it was a recording of Ubuk, and it was like a dying language, right? And there's cars honking. <laughs> and, uh, um, okay, Georgian, right? All right. Uh, Georgian uh, has uh, uh, what we call velarized and uvularized sounds. So it have, will have something like uh, ta, and it will have something like ta, and it will have something like ta. <laughs> and they're all one sound. And I'll give you a contrast. Um, it, gives, it gives you very uh, bizarre consonant clusters. Uh, Tbilisi is the capital. T -b Tbilisi, with a T in front of the B, and that's a cluster, they say it. And then Tbilisi, which is a T, T and a K together, T and that means sweet, Tbilisi. And it's distributed exactly the same way that a single T would be distributed. It is part of the cluster with B, they have that. 
And then there's the beautiful word, I am peeling it, which is fpskavnes, fprtskavnes. And there you have this huge mouthful. And uh, you have to go to something like uh, some of the uh, languages of British Columbia and Alaska and this sort of place, or some of the Berber languages of the mountains of North Africa to get something similar to that. Very complex, but it's real complexity. Uh, begins when they start expressing verbs um, or the way they put sentences together. So if I were kissing someone and it wasn't completed, I would say, I am kissing her, it's progressive. The I is in a, what we call non nominative case, the her is in some kind of uh, dative or whatever object. But if the kissing is all done, it's me kissed she. It seems to be backwards, I think, what's, what in the world's going on? And Georgian does this. My daughter did it once at dinner when she was little. I was the last one eating my meal, and she said, Mommy, Daddy is eating at dinner. That's what the Georgians do routinely. She didn't get around to saying the dinner eat daddy, which would have been when I was finished. So she was halfway through Georgian, but there, there you have it. And um, uh, even seasoned linguists, a friend of mine, a polyglot, speaks more than 52 languages. Um, he was trying to learn Georgian and got it all wrong. And I said, no, Georgian works this way, believe it or not. So even with a, a man who was familiar with it, everything from uh, uh, Native American languages through Armenian to Chinese, he had trouble with Georgian. And uh, this sets that entire family apart with this peculiar pattern. Uh, let's go now to the Northwest Caucasus and uh, languages like Circassian, Abkhazian, and Ubukh. They have lots and lots of consonants. They're different from Georgian. What they do is they make almost maximal use of the human ability to make sound. They have consonants at every point of articulation in the throat. In fact, we, we have found new ones as a result of studying these languages. And furthermore, they round and, and palatalize and do all kinds of weird things with the consonants as well. And they're all separate single sounds. And they have only two vowels. And so what they're doing is sort of attributing all the variation in, in the vowel to the consonants. Whereas most languages, they, they attribute the variation in the consonants to the vowels. So it's sort of a mirror image of a normal and natural language. And uh, furthermore, they, they, I'll give you an example from Ubik of a series of sounds. They have s, they have sh, they have uh, sh, they have sh, they have sh, and they have sh. And those are all separate sounds, and they're all made in the front of the mouth. In the back of the mouth, you have similar kind of proliferation of sound. So enormously heavy uh, sound systems in terms of consonants are very tiny vowels. The verbs are also very complicated. The verb inflex for every noun in the sentence, plus the speaker's attitude, plus where it's at, plus how it got there. And when you hear a conversation between two people speaking this, once they get the nouns pegged down, the conversation becomes a whole string of verbs. <laughs> it's describing what's happened to these things. Um, very odd. And then let's go across now to um, Northeast Caucasus, which has the Northeast Caucasian family. That includes the Chechen. And they have lots of consonants, and they have lots of vowels too. So I can't explain all the consonants the way I did with the Northwest family. I can't do it. They just seem to have all these. And they have prolonged consonants. So they have something like asa, asa, and it's not two S's in a row because a double or long S can be doubled itself, and you get asa. Well, you have to go to places like maybe Delaware and Ottawa, Odawa, or something in the Algonquin family of North America to find something like that, maybe to Estonian in Europe to find these prolonged consonants. So they have this peculiar feature as well. They also have what we call grammatical class. So you may be familiar if you know Italian or German or Russian with masculine, and feminine, and neuter. These languages do more than that. They can have up to 12 of these categories. And they mark the verb for these categories. So if something does something and it's masculine, it's wasala, something like that. If it's feminine, it's yasala. And, so, and if it's ma plural, it's rasala, uh, neuter. But then they go on with a whole bunch more, and they don't inflect the verb for person. And it is the only language for me known on earth that does not inflect its verb for person, but it does for a grammatical category. So they don't want, it does inflect. Uh, you get languages that don't inflect the verb at all. So it's as though they don't inflect the verb at all, but they do inflect for grammatical categories. The only place on earth we know of that. So the three families are very different, and they're very complex, and they sound to the untrained ear all sort of alike, like a huge amount of noise. But even to the trained ear, 
the richness of the sound systems are, are remarkable and stunning, and the complexity of the grammars is something that's actually baffling. So these are extremely interesting languages for the, for the linguist. Okay? They're very rich, their expressive power is, is, is enormous. Now, socially and politically, um, the region uh, had three nations. It had a kind of Abkhazian kingdom, it had a Georgian kingdom, and it had an Albanian kingdom. These were set up by a Byzantine emperor to act as buffer states uh, against uh, the Sasanian uh, Iranians at the time, uh, and then later against the Turkic intruders like the Seljuks and later Ottomans. And they survived right down to the Russian conquest of the region and became um, independent states with the collapse of the Soviet Union. Albania became Azerbaijan, and the language changed. And we have just, in my own time of my own career, discovered um, uh, the, the script of the ancient Albanians, now apparently supposed to be Albanian, something like that, um, and identified the language as still surviving in a tiny little language of the Northeast Caucasus called Udi, which spills down is actually on Georgian territory. It was on Azeri territory. So this region still is, a, is an identifiable zone and state, but it's had a language change. Um, but the Georgian persists, the Abkhazian persists, they had a, a war, uh, but these have ancient roots. To the north, the other societies, the other groups, such as the Chechens or the Dagestanis, the Northwest Caucasian peoples, the Circassians and Ubiks, they had alternatives to state formation. They had very elaborate structures involving hierarchies of princes and nobles and the common people and so on. And within this, they had set up a very militaristic, powerful kind of social organization, but it wasn't what we call a nation state. It was an alternative to that. It's a very interesting one. You go into Dagestan, to the high mountains with all these different languages, and you get something else that's very peculiar. You get nested defense agreements. They're traditional, they're all understood, they're not written down, but if any of these people are attacked, they can always count on several other neighbor peoples to come to their aid. And if those are, as a group, are attacked, then it becomes a higher, wider circle of people that come to their aid until finally the entire region is mobilized. And when the Russians invaded in the 19th century and uh, fought to conquer the area, and it took them generations to do this, by the time they had conquered, the entire area was mobilized against the Russians. So it's, it's a peculiar kind of nested security uh, structure. Among all the peoples, there's a kind of social rank and it's based on two things, how ferocious they are in battle because these tiny ethnic groups have never survived if they hadn't dug in their heels and, and, and challenged anyone who tried to conquer them and displace them. It's been a refuge for people over the millennia. And the ones that have the greatest prestige are the oldest ones or the ones that are most warlike or a combination of the two. Now there are peoples in the area that belong to, or speak languages belonging to external language families. One of these are the Ossetians. They speak an Iranian language, similar to that in Iran or that in Afghanistan, those languages in Afghanistan. But they came in about 1,400 years ago, something like that, 1,600 years ago. The Johnnies come lately. They have fairly low prestige as a result. Even lower on the totem pole are some Turkic-speaking peoples that only came in 1,000 years ago. So if you're thinking, well, you know, this is a really old place because it's been here for 150 years and I know great-grandpa helped found it and all that, that's not going to cut it in this part of the world. <laughs> you're completely out of your depth on that one. So if you're not there for, say, more than 3,000 years, you're sort of weak. The other factor is who's the most ferocious, and we're, of course, familiar with the Russian-Chechen wars, and we're very savage, very difficult, the tiny nation of Chechnya gave the entire Russian military quite a run for its money. They look like Boy Scouts compared to the Circassians and the Ubuks, and these were considered, the Ubuks particularly, were considered the most warlike people in the entire region. It didn't work in their favor. Everyone wanted to marry an Ubuk. They were uh, handsome people, and so the language itself pretty much went extinct. I'm one of the last speakers of this. So uh, it, uh, they, they were siphoned off and they basically married into surrounding populations and uh, were under pressure and when the Russians dispersed these people down to the Middle East, um, they uh, eventually lost their language. Um, the multiplicity of ethnic groups uh, persists not only because they're, they're tough and resistant, but because they're tolerant as well. And part of the mechanisms of tolerance 
is a, a whole battery, a whole repertoire of ethnic jokes. These aren't particularly seen as politically correct uh, in our society, but they are a vital mechanism for letting off steam and tension uh, in the Caucasus. So I'll give you one. I'll tell you one now. There are two peoples. One are called Avars, and the others are called um, Laks, I think it is. It's Avar and a Lak. And the Avars are very warlike, and the Laks are a little more trade-oriented, a little more, um, what we would say, sedate, perhaps. So an Avar and a Lak are riding in a car in the Caucasus. Yeah, they have cars, right? They have roads now. And they're going along, blasting along, and the Avar's driving, and they see a red light, and the Avar shoots through the red light. And the Lak says, you know, that was a red light. You just shot through the red light. He doesn't say anything. When they come to another red light, Avar shoots through that one, too. And this time the Lak says, look, look, what are you doing? I mean, you shot through two red lights. <laughs> he said, I am an Avar. I am a warrior people. We don't care about the red light. We are brave. We're going to go through the red light. They come up to a green light. Avar stops. And the Lak says, what are you doing now? It's a green light. And the Avar says, you can never be too careful. There may be an Avar coming the other way. <laughs> Okay, and there's a whole bunch of these. Uh, that was told by someone who was an Archie, uh, the hereditary ruler of the Archie uh, people who occupy one village and speak one language <laughs> way up there in the hills. And this is what it's like in the Caucasus. And, and they think of themselves as nations, but if you go there and travel, they're very hospitable people, make very good food. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's hard to get around, but, uh, but uh, the people try to make it easy. Uh, they think of themselves as a nation, but you're going to look at it, and it's going to feel like a neighborhood. Um, so it's a very weird, it's a very strange area, and the whole issue of identity and national uh, sense of nationhood and all that, these things can be sort of tested there. It's an interesting um, uh, testing ground. Now, the area uh, was independent. It had resisted the invasion of the Mongols. In fact, the Mongols, there's evidence the Mongols were defeated by a massed army of these people who came out and meet them, met them on the steppe. Uh, we do know that uh, the Circassians had become the rulers of Egypt uh, in the Mameluk system under the Seljuks. They had become the Circassian Mameluks. And when the Mongols were finally defeated at the Spring of Goliath uh, in their uh, effort to advance across the Middle East, they were defeated by Kutuz. And Kutuz was a Circassian. Um, and the name itself, Kutuzov, uh, reflected a Russian family that was of Circassian origin, and Kutuzov later defeated Napoleon. So <laughs> uh, the tradition of being ferocious and effective warriors uh, can go right down through a family. And um, uh, uh, it served them well until they met a nation that was modernizing and industrializing. And even as, as initial, as, as weak, and, and as part, uh, rudimentary as the industrialization of Russia was in the late 18th, early 19th centuries, it was sufficient for them to fight against these people and ultimately defeat them. Um, and what then happened was that, uh, in the case of the Circassians and Ubiks and Abkhaz, they were dispersed. They had a choice either to settle up in uh, further north of the traditional territory in southern Russia, which they didn't want to do, or to be absorbed or taken by the Ottoman Empire. And they were brought into the Ottoman Empire. And when that broke up, they left communities in Turkey, uh, Jordan, Syria, uh, a few in Iraq, some in Israel. Uh, and we now have some in the uh, United States, some here in California, uh, some in, in New, Jer New Jersey, New York area. And now where I live in Canada, there are even some families who are refugees from Syria. So they're trying to maintain the language, they're trying to maintain the culture, the customs under very difficult circumstances. And I think that they see uh, the kinds of tales that I've worked on as their voice as a people, and they are, are amazed and delighted that the rest of the world seems to care and seems to enjoy these. So I think this is a very important development for them. If I can very quickly, quickly uh, summarize the talk by talking about some of the prominent features that can be found in the folklore that are also features of their cultures of these people. And the one that jumps out immediately, most prominently, is the prestige of women and the respect that women enjoy, uh, particularly in the Ossetian area, the center of the North Caucasus, and then to the west among Circassians and Abkhaz and Uvuk too. Uh, so the women are, um, traditionally oriented through certain tasks. Men have certain tasks. For example, a woman can sew cloth, a man sews leather, this sort of thing, so on and so forth. A woman makes the meal, she can join the men at the table, and then the men have to applaud her as her performance, you know, to show how, what a skilled hostess she is, and so on. Um, but they, they have freedom. They even have sexual freedom to, to take men into their beds and to cheat on the husband as long as no one knows. 
Okay. But it's not seen as cheating. It's not seen as, as, as hiding. It's seen as just trying to preserve the good friends and the good relationship. And they have the right to do it. It's not a question of, of, of a breach of protocol or ethics. Uh, it's very strange. They have almost the same kind of latitude that we attribute to the sort of men who are fooling around and whatnot. It's, it's very interesting. So they have sexual freedom uh, of a major sort. They venerate the elderly. And um, <laughs> yours truly turned 71 this year. Oh, dear. Well, I, I was cheered up by my Circassian friend. He said, you're a full man. I said, I'm what? You're a full man. What is that? A man between 70 and 90 is a prestigious man. You have to listen to him. He's an honorable leader of the community and whatnot. This is your time. <laughs> I thought marvelous. He said, but, but, we always tell the women that a man past 100 is no longer much of a man. So be careful whom you marry. And so they live to be very old. And what's remarkable is that when you see them, I have a friend. His wife is, I know, uh, the, he's my brother. She's my sister. We'll talk about it in a second. Um, she's my sister. Uh, she's 48. I thought he was uh, maybe 55. He's 84. Nah. I had a driver. I was running around the area. I was talking with him. And, and I thought he was about 30, 35. I said, how old are you? I'm 50. I have another friend, I thought maybe he was 70 years old, he's 90 years old. And I think that this, you know, the diet's good, the exercise, blah, 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 the genes may be good too, but the social support, the honor and prestige that they enjoy in their old age, I think keeps them young. And I think that's a very good thing that for us to learn as well. It's, um, it's Hospitality, I mentioned that with the women doing the dinners and all that. A guest is a sacred, um, a sacred visitor and brings enormous prestige to the family and uh, in tr traditional times are actually tales where uh, the host would fight to the death to protect his guest. So someone would seek refuge with you, and then, then you know, that's it. maybe the end. You have to fight to protect that, that the guest no matter what, who comes for him and whatnot. So hospitality w was amazing. And you go, and you're fed, and you're fed. And I'll give you a trick how, if you ever end up with the hospitality, how to survive a banquet. Don't eat everything on your plate, <laughs> which is what we feel we should do. Leave some because if you eat everything on your plate, next thing you know, you got another whole plate <laughs> in front of you, and you expect to eat that one too. So don't don't do that. Um, they are also blessed with an amazing sense of style. Uh, they have beautiful national costumes, and you'll see the Cossacks with these fancy things and the hats and all that. They're just trying to imitate the Circassians, and the Circassian garb is called the Cherkeska. Cherkess being the, the Italian, ultimately Italian word for these people, and because um, they traded with the Italians. And it's now the costume across the Caucasus, bullets across the chest, tight caftan, for, and the dancing. The women have what's called the fascia. They have almost a medieval conical hat and beautiful uh, brocade garments uh, with long sleeves, you know, and, and a scarf coming out of the hat. Uh, so it looks almost like medieval garb, and it's formal dress in the Caucasus. You see the dance troops, you can Google uh, Circassian dancing or, or, or Chechen dancing, and you'll see the, the costumes. Very fine sense of style when they start wearing modern stuff as well. They're always dressed to the nines, and they look very, very good. Um, the dancing, where they still use the costumes, is spectacular. It's among the most acrobatic known on earth. They leap through the air, the men will dance on their knees, dance on their toes, as though they have the ballet slippers on, but they don't. They just have a leather sock on or whatnot. Uh, the women glide about. The men whirl about them. They leap through the air. Um, they have uh, war dances. And, and uh, uh, one of the Chechen dance, the man gyrates around the woman, comes very close, and w without any pre premeditation will blast or yell in her face and stun her. Right? Uh, but she's not to show any disturbance whatsoever. She's supposed to just be serenely gliding along. And, and uh, <laughs> it's really uh, quite something. And so the, um, the dances reflect the warrior spirit to some extent, and the athleticism and the um, uh, exuberance uh, of the people. Uh, and it is a, a mechanism that is seen as a kind of social glue. Uh, so they all gather, they all they want to listen to the music, they want to hear, the, see the dancing, they want to participate in the dancing, and they have dancing for various ages. So little kids have a little dance, young youth, youths and maidens have their own very vigorous dances, and then the elder, there's a dance for people over 100. And in fact, there was a dance troupe that toured the U.S. some 20 years ago, 
uh, every member of this dance troupe was 100 or older. And they're sedate, but they're still out there dancing, <laughs> and they're getting their, their exercise. Um, and uh, it is a vital mechanism for not only recognizing stages of life, but for maintaining cohesion of the community with all these stages playing a role uh, in that. Um, in the original countryside, where there's still uh, uh, communities of these people, uh, about 500,000 now, perhaps uh, circassians in uh, various republics of the North, uh, Northwest Caucasus zone. Um, the old elderly uh, are assigned various tasks suitable for their age. And so um, uh, they will be uh, out there vigorously harvesting a field of wheat or corn or something like that, but the elderly will be picking fruit. Now you think that's sort of an easy thing, but what the elderly do is they climb up in the trees to pick the fruit. <laughs> So even there, they may not be bending over and, and, and carrying huge um, burdens of, of sheaths, of, uh, sheaves of grain or whatever, but, but they're still doing athletic stuff that you wouldn't think a 90-year-old should be doing. They're up in the tree, uh, <laughs> picking out the peaches and apples and, and this sort of thing. So they have built into the culture mechanisms that perhaps we just began to realize are important for vitality and prolonged youth, exercise, respect. Uh, recognition of, of uh, a life uh, of accumulated knowledge and uh, these sorts of things. Um, hospitality to, to guests, um, um, a desire for, for prestige, although it's evanescent prestige. At the time you have the guest, you enjoy the prestige and honor of the community. When they're gone, it's, it's back to normal, so to speak. But uh, the culture in itself and its own dynamics is fascinating. And uh, there are variabilities uh, all over the place um, between them, but the, these overall features dominate and characterize the entire region. And I'm going to close on one interesting thing. Years ago, when I was a professor in Vienna, I was uh, working with a young Circassian, and I was looking for words for mountain. And I asked him, he was, he, uh, he was fluent uh, in one of the dialects, I wanted a word for mountain that matched the word Lüche, Lüche in Ubuch. And the obvious choice, believe it or not, was Kluschle, Kluschle and Circassian. And in this dictionary by the late uh, Hans Vogt of Oslo, uh, there was the word Lichetut. It said, a mythological wild man of the mountains. And I said, OK, you got this Lichetut, a wild man of the mountains. What would you say in Circassian? Oh, that's a Kluschle. And Kl is the word for man. So it's mountain man. And I said, oh, yeah, you got the same mythical being at all. And he paused for a second, looked me in the eye. I said, well, it's not a myth. It's not a myth. I said, what? <laughs> no, it's not a myth. There are these people up in the hills. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. He said, well, look, I used to go hunting with my father in, in eastern Turkey. He was from Turkey. He said, he, he would show me the footprints of a bear or footprints of a cat or whatever. And he, one day he drew these funny footprints that look like human footprints, but they're sort of smaller and more crude. And he said, if you see these footprints, don't track this animal. It's just too dangerous. I've never seen them down here in Turkey, but if you go up north, maybe on vacation and want to go hunting, be careful, because they're up there. <laughs> I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, it's about that tall, and it has a face that sticks out, and it's covered with hair, and they live way up in the forest and the hills, and, and you know, we leave them alone. Sometimes they come down for some crops, and we'll give them some food, and they go back up, and all that kind of stuff. And he said, there are men who gain fame by trading with them. <laughs> and by this time, I'm completely incredulous. I'm thinking of you know, Bigfoot, Sasquatch, or whatever. This is Littlefoot, <laughs> Sasquatchette, or something like that. And I said, well, how do they gain fame by trading with them? Well, you see, you go up in a, hit, a clearing up, way up in the forest, and uh, you stay there, camp there a few nights, and they know you're there. Uh, and the leader of the, of the, of the uh, Kushat band will come out and sort of show half of himself from behind a tree. And that's a sign that he wants to come out and deal with you. So you sort of say, hey, you know, come, come. Why do you offer some food or something? Come out, you eat together. And then they trade. And I said, what, what? Well, they give them trinkets, and they, then they give you something. And what do they give you? Uh, well, you don't, I don't know, I don't know. But they, they, there's some kind of trade. I said, what's dangerous about that? Ah, I said, when you're leaving and they're gone and you're going back down the mountain to your village, they will attack you from the, from the forest. They waylay you to try to get their stuff back. <laughs> I said, how perfectly human is that? And uh, I didn't know what to make of it. And then about 15 years later, they discovered a fossil in Georgia of a small kind of primitive man called Homo Manisi, after the Manisi, that's the Georgian cluster, DM, the Manisi Gorge. Homo Manisi. No one quite knows what they make of it. It's a Homo erectus or whatever it is. 
But that seems to be a relic surviving in the Caucasus. And then I began to look at it, and they had all these accounts of these, uh, which Hayat Almas is the Turkish word for it, and they'll come down to the mountain village and, and maybe give birth in the barn, and you shelter them, they'll let them go again when they're ready to go back up into the woods. You'll give them some leftover food at harvest and this sort of stuff. They're diminished, probably because of disease. But it sounds as though we have some kind of ancestral form running around in the Caucasus. And there are Russian anthropologists uh, and all taking this very seriously and, and uh, investigating this. So maybe we'll end up having a, a kind of hobbit on hand and um, learn a whole much more about our background uh, and not just about how exotic and, and rich uh, this re re region is. Um, and on that note, I, I hope that you uh, will one day perhaps have a chance to uh, meet not only Circassians and Chechens and Georgians, but maybe one of these little hairy people as well. Thank you.